All right, let's get this going. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to the last session of the day. Um, I see some of you brought your own drinks to the Drunk Agile session. Good. Unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, Dan and I are not drinking today, but we, yeah, I know we're going to be a lot more boring than usual. Um, but for those of you who don't know us, Dan out there in in Florida, say something, Dan. Something, Dan. Uh, and I'm, I'm Pradeek Singh. Uh, this is this is going to be a little different, but probably not. Uh, we're going to start off with an interesting exercise, and then which will be done in probably 10 minutes, and then we're going to throw the floor open for questions. And then if there are not a lot of questions, we'll get out of here early, but we are hoping there are questions, so don't. Um, that's not encouragement to, to, to not ask questions. This is why we provided you with drinks, so that you stay here. Um, but to, 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 to kick things off, this is, it's not drunk agile unless you get to see Nisha. So yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately. So Nisha couldn't make it over, she doesn't fly, she refuses. Uh, but yeah, she, she's not here, but you get to see Nisha. Uh, what I am going to ask you all to do is, you might need your laptops, iPads, phones for this, this next little bit. Um, and we're gonna run you through a little exercise here. What, what we, yeah, I know, it's the end of the day. Um, what I would want you all to do is to go to this URL. Sorry to the organizers of the conference, we stole that. If it does ask for your credit card, please put it in. <laughs> I'm going to quickly show you. You should all see something that looks like this. I'm going to leave the URL up there for a little bit longer. While you all are getting there, let me explain what this is, what you're seeing. Um, what Dan and I are asking you to do to, is to enter the number that you think will be closest to two-thirds of the average of all the numbers entered. So we're going to take the average of all the numbers that are entered, we're going to take two-thirds of that number, and I want you individually to guess what that number would be. Does yeah, I, 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 I pro, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm asking you to do maths at the end of the day. But you have options 1 through 100. Let's, so 0 to 100, essentially. Let's go do this again. Let's go back to the same URL and try to answer the same question once again. Let's see if you can do better a second time. All right, the answers are in. Great. So look at the summary. <laughs> did anyone get close to 13 or 14? What did you have? 12 or 11. Uh, someone at 12? 12? 14? 14? 10? 15? Doesn't count. <laughs> 13. 13. <laughs> People got 13 and 14 because they went in twice. Um, what was different in this round than the first round? Had information. You had some historical data. Yeah. There was a smaller span of numbers we were focusing on. All right. What else? You knew how to game the system. Sorry. You knew, how to game the system. you knew how to game the system this time. Yes. You knew the rules that you, which obviously you didn't run the rules first time, right? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Learn from your mistakes. Absolutely. Um, so I heard a bunch of answers that were more about we made a mistake earlier, it narrowed down our options, and we're trying to learn from that. Um, in fact, this time around, I think we had at least five or six people who got this right, maybe even more, as compared to zero last time. 
Why is that? An anchor. An anchor, yeah. An anchor. Yeah, we, had, we, we kind of knew that we were going towards the lower side of this. What else? We know the market a little better, yeah. We we know that we know no one, not not everyone is putting in a hundred, so sixty six is obviously not right at that point, yeah. What else? Assumptions. The assumptions we have we have invalidated some assumptions we had the first time. We have reduced the span of numbers, so it's the greater likelihood that any number could be right, yeah. We just got more information, absolutely, and then we could use it. Dan? Do you want me to keep going? Yes, you. Okay, okay, me. All right. As we were doing this, so we got more information, we got new information, we were able to invalidate some assumptions. What helped us get better? What was this thing that we did that helped us get better? Yeah. Absolutely. We, we discussed it. There were some learnings we took from the first time, and we applied those. Um, in, since you, this is lean agile, uh, in agile lingo, what do we commonly call that? Iteration. I just heard someone say iteration. Yeah, iterations, iterations, however you pronounce it. Uh, we, we're talking about iterations. We're talking about iterating. We're talking about um, essentially recursion. We're talking about keep finding out where, where, where things are going, what, what really is valuable. From, I'm going to ask this question in a weird way, but from a pure economics perspective, what do you think is the right answer to this exercise? Yes? We don't have uh, maybe, maybe. Phil? Zero. zero. If everyone guesses zero, Everyone is right. What if you keep playing it, then it go down if you, if you, yeah, if you keep playing this, if you keep iterating on this over and over again, we will eventually find out that the right answer is zero. This is our opinion, that agility is about iterating and finding out what the right value is. Many a time we, we, we think we know what value is and we start chasing it, but we really don't. Agility is about iterating with the customer as often as possible to find out what value is. How do we iterate with the customer right now, for most of you? Yeah, releasing increments and, and um, yeah, there was... So feedback, yeah, releasing the increment, getting that feedback. Um, and how often do you release that increment? Not enough. <laughs> Not enough, yeah. It depends how soon the customer It depends how soon the customer needs the product, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully everyone's actually delivering it whenever the customer needs the product. But but in our in our in our world, how what what determines when you are lining yourself up for that feedback? For you all. What does that what determines that? talked about iterations. What is iteration? How long the releases are? What do you associate iterations with most? Sprints. Yeah, we, we, we have a sprint goal. We deliver this. We figure out if, if, if it matched. What if you could iterate faster than your sprints? <laughs> what? What was the question? Sorry? Is it, legal? Is it legal? Is it legal to iterate faster than your sprints? Yeah. What if you were not constrained by this time box? What if you could literally think outside the time box? <laughs> Essentially, the earth, if, earth, if the discovery of value in our success depends on how quickly we get feedback, why shouldn't we get feedback with every item? Sorry? Yeah, ideally, let's get feedback with every item. Let's not have this false constraint of a sprint or a release stopping us from getting feedback. Let's get feedback with every item. Let's have every item adjust our goals. Let's have every item adjust our, our, our backlogs. Sorry, question.
Yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat that, and I'm going to try to do justice to what you just said, and please tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, the, the getting that feedback is a hard thing in most, in most environments currently, because the technical excellence might not exist. Uh, the team might not have bandwidth to figure out, to, 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 to get that feedback. Uh, all, all those things might be issues that get in your way of getting feedback. But what we have discovered, at least with this little exercise, and it was just sample, is probably the most important thing for us is to figure out if we're working on something that's valuable or not. So while it might be hard right now, we want to evolve and optimize our, pro our processes towards feedback. Uh, how do we shorten that feedback loop? And that, so absolutely, Great point, the fact that many a time our technical restrictions stop us, but if we are to remove them, how do we remove them so that we can get to that point? Yeah. Question there. There's also a logical piece, right? If the time taken to measure exceeds the increment, then your cost is all measurement. Yep. You see that sometimes in processes in engineering where you're trying to measure something, actually the biggest cost is the measurement. So you can get rid of the measurement at the micro and get an improvement. Um, I'm going to come to that, but is there another mic that we can pass around when people ask questions so that Dan can hear us? Because he looks really bored. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so the, the question was about the time, the time it takes to get feedback uh, and the amount of effort that goes into getting that feedback could be very different. Absolutely. Um, and again, that's, that's where I'll go. I, I'll, I'll keep ham hammering this drum over and over again. That, Techn whether it's technical excellence, whether it's figuring out how we can get faster feedback from customers, we need to keep optimizing it to figure out what are these things that we need to be working on, because the most wasteful thing we can do is work on the wrong things, assuming we know what value is ahead of time. I think we're already in the Q&A section of this, right? Yeah, we are. So w w one of the things I will say is, if you have questions about anything you've ever seen us talk about, you can throw them out as well. It doesn't have to be constrained to this, but we're on a good thread right now, so we can continue with that. Anyone else? What else? What else about feedback? Or did I already prime you with, I'm going to let you leave early if you don't ask questions? Is that what happened? Sorry, question here. So. Sometimes there's the danger of thinking that the only valuable feedback comes from within the organization and we lose the focus on who is the actual individual or user which is taking benefit from whatever we deliver. So the technical excellence and all that stuff instantly evaporates when we ask people binary question. Is it working? Yes, no. Is it valuable? Yes, no. And if not, what else? Felt more like a comment than a question. Okay, it was a question. I have a comment. Oh, yes, I think we agree. <laughs> yes, out there. Uh, about the <coughs> feedback, um, so far I've been in many transformations, and uh, all I'm seeing about feedback is just the status checks. So, in many organizations, we do reviews and we get feedback from the so-called feedback from the stakeholders, but I don't think they are, that's the real feedback. So r the feedback loops are usually longer and most organizations, unfortunately, they don't focus on the uh, actual feedback. They are not maybe interested or they f figure out very late, uh, actually. I, I yeah. don't know. I, it's it's interesting for me, and, and Dan, do you want to take that, or should I just go with it? Okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's, I feel like I'm doing this whole thing. As, as, if you've ever taken a class with Dan and I, this is exactly how it is. Um, uh, yeah, so oh, the, the, I think one interesting thing about feedback, and, and this is a completely different talk, is we do feedback all wrong. We ask people, how do you feel about this? Is this working for you? Instead of actually looking at customer metrics to figure out, has the click rate gone up? Are more people, are, are more people using the product? Uh, are, are, uh, is, is option A producing more tra traffic through, or is option B producing more traffic through? 
there is a great book that I like to refer. It's called Everybody Lies. And that's, that's, that's a, that, that applies to our feedback all the time. We go to stakeholders and go, what do you think about this? Or cu even customers, what do you think about this? That, that's not feedback. Feedback is instrumenting your code to find out what people are actually doing. That, and yeah, that goes to that point of it takes a little while to, to collect that. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just going to have to. Sorry. If, uh, can, I, can I jump in with, with two points? No. Now? Since, since I need to correct you, Pratik, uh, everything you've said that, that's wrong. Can I, can I do that? Go. Um, two, so, yeah, two, two things I would say. There was, I think there was somebody who said early on the purpose of product development is to, to deliver value. Um, if, if, if I would tweak that a little bit, I would say the purpose of product development is to deliver what we think our best guess at value is. That's, that's really the purpose because we don't know what value is. Um, and I would follow that up with, uh, with uh, quoting Don Reinertsen, and I don't know who had 455 as the first time that we would quote, quote Don Reinertsen in this, uh, in this talk, but um, Don likes to, likes to say that cycle time starts when the first dollar is spent, you know, he's, he's, and, and I'm, a, I'm a big believer in that. Likewise, I would say cycle time probably doesn't stop until we've we've gotten feedback from whoever is actually giving us money for what we're producing assuming this is a for-profit thing right um so cycle time starts when the first dollar is spent cycle time doesn't finish until we get feedback from from somebody who's actually paying us who's actually actually giving us money okay <laughs> nice i had a question about optimization so optimization i find tends to go towards um local maximum or minima um, and you can often have teams that uh, look at their metrics a lot who sort of get you know very demoralized by just that a relentless death march towards optimizing a metric um, so I suppose first part is um, how do you motivate teams that are moving incrementally towards delivering value and then the second part how do you work out when you need to fundamentally rethink step back and actually look for a, a step change, so you're getting away from a local maxima or minima. Dan? Well, okay, I'll, I'll go first. My, so, my, my, my uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of motivation, uh, I, I, everybody knows that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that, that, that data matters, people don't matter. Um, I'm just, I'm just really, really, it's hard for me, it's hard for me to, to talk about people's feelings. But what I will say is that my, my definition of professionalism, my fundamental definition of professionalism is showing up every day with the belief that you can get better. If you, if you look at the consummate professionals in their fields, you know, and I was, I always talk about sports people. If you look at like Serena Williams or LeBron James or Rafael Nadal or something like that, every day they show up every day with the belief that they can get better. I don't know if they necessarily care about stats. I don't know if they necessarily care about metrics or anything like that, but they believe um, that that they can get better. So, you know, mo motivation. I, I, you know, that I think you've just got to make that part of your uh, part of your professional outlook. Again, that's just that's just that's just my thought. My thought there. Um, I don't know, Pratik, you want to add, add to that? Yeah, I was going to take a completely different tact on that. But, uh, well, uh, first, you know it's a Dan Vacanti talk if Rafael Nadal has been mentioned. Um, and, and second, um, I, I'm a big fan of Schuert and Deming, so is Dan. And you talked about local maxima and local optimization. Uh, Deming was talking about this 60 years ago saying you need to look at the whole and even if you sub optimize sometimes you might have to actually sub optimize things in a subsystem to optimize the whole system uh, that's where i would look i would look let's look at the entire system and figure out if the entire system is providing value and kind of leave the teams alone for a little bit to see if the whole system is working and then kind of figure out hey yes, where, where else do we need to to move yes. if your have, team have we Sorry, go ahead. Have we have we done a drunk agile on scaling? Have we? Have no, we, we haven't. Done? Oh, okay. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> when we do our drunk agile on scaling, you know, we'll, we'll talk we'll talk about scaling flow. It's not just about most people think scaling is about just scaling the number of teams and trying to get all the teams to work together. That's really not what scaling is about. It's about it's how do we scale flow? Um, so I don't know, Pratik, you want to. Yeah, just, um, I, I, I just felt like I had to interrupt you and, and throw you off, uh, off course first. Yeah, and, 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 and take the punchline. 
Yeah, uh, okay. essentially, everyone thinks, when we talk about scaling, everyone thinks scaling is about adding more teams or creating more products. No, it's about scaling flow of value to the customer. How do you make, how do you make sure higher level flow items actually make it to the customer in time? And again, love referring Deming. Deming was talking about this 50, 60 years ago. We, all of Agile has not invented anything new in 50 or 60 years. I would have you all go back and read Schuert and Deming, and that's pretty much all you need. Definitely don't read Vacanti. That doesn't work. <laughs> As soon as, I know, as soon as Dan mentioned Nadal, I knew you guys weren't going to ask any more questions. Thank you. Uh, testing, okay. Um, so I have a question. Uh, so the whole agile, um, you know, lifestyle or like way of being, I guess, I guess do you think that's applicable in an in, in insignificant role like, a McDonald's worker, I don't mean to insult like McDonald's consumers, but you know, do you think that it could make that type of system work better? Do you think agile is applicable for every single scenario? Dan, do you want I, to take I, that I, question? I, I know that voice, don't I? I know that. It's me. <laughs> I'm Pratik's daughter, by the way. So. <laughs> Dan? Any, any, we, we, yeah, we say this all the time. Any, anywhere there's flow, anywhere there's, there's value be delivered, we, we, we believe that, that these principles can be applied. So whether you're talking about ordering coffee at Starbucks, whether you're talking about security at the airport, you know, whether you're talking about software, you know, I mean, any, anywhere there's flow, uh, these, um, these principles can be applied. And I have no doubt that, well, I have doubt about, I have doubt about Starbucks. Um, but I have no doubt that McDonald's, at least, has probably studied these principles. I, you know, I, I would hope so. Um, e even if us in Agile have not, we seem to be going the other way with some of the, f the frameworks and methodologies that we put in place. It seem to be kind of anti-flow. Um, yeah, and, and, and to add to that, again, when, when, when Deming and Schuert were writing about this stuff, software doesn't, didn't exist, technically. So we're talking about exactly flow of value. It's, it's not a question, it's like an answer to your question. I've been working as an Agile coach for Ukrainian McDonald's with their marketing and operation teams. And I, how to do it carefully. I've heard rumors that some big consultancy companies were trying to implement in different regions of companies like restaurants with M in the name, because I've signed NDA, as you can imagine. So <laughs> uh, there were some experiments, some successful, some not. But if you will be focused on a purpose, not just copy-pasting framework or following two, two A4 pages of recommendation from big consultancy, and you'll be really focused on the product and the flow, then it could be really beneficial. For example, we've been improving such an abstract thing like hospitality. So each guest could feel like at home of a lovely granny, you know, uh, when he comes to the restaurant. Uh, it's very abstract. You, you cannot uh, use waterfall, you know, upfront analysis and then all the stuff. So you, you need to iterate and you need to be brave enough and have the safety to, to try and experiment. So I, I do believe that it might work, but as it mentioned on the t-shirts, uh, Agile has no brain, so you will need to use your own. <laughs> I have a question back there, so I'm going to hand this, and I'm going to take that mic. Again, I think this is more of an answer rather than a question. When McDonald's was originally founded, the brothers, their main focus was specializing the actual, how the kitchen was built to ensure almost there were no physical bottlenecks when making the burgers, because takeaway burgers already existed. But what made McDonald's so successful was how they perfected how they built their kitchens so their servers could perfectly serve the burgers and just push them out as quick as possible. So in a way, whilst they weren't dealing with anything like stories or anything like that, they were focusing on the fundamentals in terms of swarming around that bottleneck and getting those those foundations set to make sure that when they did deliver those burgers, they were, being, they were doing it as efficiently as possible. And that's what helped make McDonald's become so successful, along with a lot of other things. Watch The Founders, it's a really good film.
Maybe to move away from McDonald's for a second. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it's making me hungry, um, but not for McDonald's. Uh, uh, maybe a separate tag. So thinking about you know flow and all these sorts of things. How do you think about the the design and the composition of how people work in teams relative to flow and, and what sort of impact? Right, you hear about cross-functional teams and people improving and broadening their skill sets and things like that. What role do you think that has in, in the context of, of flow? That's a great question. I'm going to take it, and then Dan, you take it after that. This is definitely a pretty no. This is definitely a pretty question. <laughs> yeah, it's all you. People start throwing things at me when I say this stuff. Um, I believe that the general guidance of small teams is awful. You should have. <laughs> you missed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I believe the general guidance of small teams is awful. You probably should have large teams and then get smaller if you need to. Your teams should, should be as efficient as possible in delivering value to customers, which means having people who understand customers' requirements, which means people who can, who can implement uh, something, build something, people who can test something, people who can deploy something, people who can market something, people who can sell something, people who can automate all this stuff, people can do all those things. And expecting six or seven people to do all of this, in my opinion, is ridiculous. If you want end to end, sorry? How big is the largest team? Um, the, the, the largest team I've ever worked with is probably 40 people. Uh, I think Dan's worked with about 60. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I feel that general agile guidance on this stuff has uh, misled people to two pizza teams. Again, referring the shirt, agile has no brain. What, uh, this goes back to the flow point. This goes back to the scaling flow point. We want to get to, we want to do things that helps deliver value to customers, or potential value to customers as quickly as possible, so we can find out what that value is. Don't let anything stand in your way. If it's small teams that works for you, use small teams if that uh, allows that to happen. If small teams don't work for you, break that rule. Whatever, come, whatever is in your way of efficiently, effectively delivering, efficiently, effectively, predictably uh, delivering potential value to customers, do it. Dan, you want to take anything else before they throw more stuff at me? I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, I, I don't know if you have any pictures. I've got pictures of, of uh, you know, my, my large team stand up. I think most of you have probably seen, seen those pictures, but. Uh... I'm happy to show some of those if anybody if anybody doesn't believe us that we ran. Yeah. Oh, the other thing I would say is, and of course we have to bring sports back into this. Um, and you know the, the 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 and I know it's just guidance, and I know it's just a recommendation. It's not a hard and fast rule, but the general guidance that teams should be you know ten or less people. To me, that means that what you know a, a, a football team is not agile. You know, a, a, an American football team is not. A cricket team is not. Right. Uh, an Australian rules football team is not right. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't believe that for a second. I was going to ask a follow up on that. Do you think that's because a lot of teams, when they go and do agile, they start where they have control, i.e., in the tech org, um, and they don't bring in other skill sets like true cross functional? P -p Possibly, it's. I think it's actually worse than that. They, they, it's not just the tech org, it's my little slice of the tech org. It's, it's like, oh, DBAs can't be on my team, and, and UX folks cannot be on my team. It's only engineers and people who do testing. Those are the only people who can. You had a question, that's a, uh, let, me, let me get the mic to you. Sorry. If you've got a team of 60 people, how long are the stand-ups? <laughs> <laughs> Best question of the day. If fatigue's, running them two, if fatigue's running them two minutes and 18 seconds. We've timed it. Yeah. Um, we, 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 would, we would always run our, our stand-ups would be less than 15 minutes and usually less than 10 minutes with a 60-person you know, a, a stand-up. Yeah, for, for 30 to 40 people. Sorry, the, the, the next question was how. Well, for 30 to 40 people, yeah, about three to five minutes because nobody needs to talk about 
to me, I am not here to find out what you did yesterday, what you, I don't care, I could care less. What I'm here to find out about is what are things that are stopping flow from happening. And usually those are two or three things, especially if you're limiting WIP. At that point, though we've talked about those three things, is there anything else we need to talk about? No, we're done. Let's go get stuff done rather than talk about work. And uh, if you want to learn more, uh, the 55 degrees booth downstairs, uh, they, they, can, they can help you out with, with what tools you could potentially use. What was the WIP limit for 60? What was the WIP limit for 60, Dan? What, sorry, I didn't hear that, what? What was the WIP limit for 60? Stop updating your Facebook. <laughs> Um, I was trying. To, I was actually trying to find the picture. I've got the picture of the board too. Um, the whip limit. So it was. Five, what was it? Five or six features. Five or six epics for the sixty-person team, um, and then it was less than less than one story per person. Uh, like I said, I go find the go find the picture and count count the board. And if, if anybody really wants me to, there was a question back there. Sorry. Yeah, I definitely can agree that removing some boundaries and you know. Like small teams can give you benefits, but how it, from your perspective, how it might affect the quality of communication between people? It's number two, but number one is how it will affect multi-learning, because as, as from my experience, when you have a limit of people, of amount of people in the team, it provokes as enabling constraint provokes them to become more cross-functional. If as a Manual software tester, I know that if we need tester automations, you will hire one or two, then why should I learn something new? Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll take that while Dan is, Dan is updating Facebook. Um, the constraint in, my, in our world is not the number of people, it's the amount of work. If you limit the number of work items, to say half the number of people you have on the team. Doesn't matter the number of people on the team, you are essentially enabling people to work with each other on the same thing. It's, it's enabling flow of work that helps move people move around and work with each other. That is how we could probably get to more cross function. It's, it's, yeah, it's the ratio, there's no hard and fast rule, ratio of, of work, work to workers. <laughs> I, I, I will say this just to, to I'll, I'll, from my context, Dan doesn't remember this, but uh, for me, when I had a team of 30 odd people, the whip, the overall whip was probably about 20. Yeah. Dan, are you still looking for the picture? I, I mean, I've got it. If anybody wants to see it, I mean, sure. Yeah. And I. Yes. Um, one second. Should I sing a song while you do that? <laughs> yeah, I, so screen share, there it is, yeah, okay, there. So yeah, like I said, a, a lot, uh, can you see it? Yep. A lot of, a lot of people have probably seen, seen this picture before. I think if you count, there's about 40 people in this picture. There's some people behind the, the person who took the picture. Uh, there are also people kind of out, out in the hall too. Um, but <laughs> stand up every day of less than 10 minutes, or less than 15 minutes usually, usually somewhere around 10. Was this the entire value stream for people adding value end to end? It's like from marketing, legal, developers, testers, whatever, end to end, or a section of that? So yeah, I mean, the, so yes, uh, this is a little bit different because this was uh, uh, an internal, this was uh, an SAP implementation, um, so it was internal only, but we did have representation for all the, all the places that were impacted by the, by, by the implementation, yes. There are people in the room laughing, saying that's why you needed 60, because of an SAP intervention. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Sorry? Was it an MVP of SAP? Was it an MVP of SAP? Otherwise, you need a 600, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, actually, it actually was, because everybody knows SAP. They got like 15 different modules. Uh, I think we, if, I, if I remember correctly, we started with, with HR or finance first, I think, and we're just kind of doing it that way.
Any other questions? <laughs> I know the temperature in this room is a little high, so it's kind of making people uncomfortable. I don't want to hold you in a room that's getting increasingly warm. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to, to Drunk Agile Live. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. I'll leave, you, I'll, leave you, I'll leave you with the first ever portfolio board. Yeah, and um, again, you can catch us on YouTube. If you want to learn more about some of the flow concepts, uh, downstairs, prokanban.org uh, booth will be there. I'll be there. We won't zoom Dan in, but <laughs> otherwise, see you all. Have fun at the rest of the conference. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.